All right, it says I'm recording, so we'll go ahead and get started. And thank you once again, everybody, for joining us today for another partner support webinar. I'm Leila Shahidel, Project Director for Wake Tech's Finish First and Seat Initiative. Now, the purpose of the partner support webinars is to provide technical support and helpful information to our partner colleges as you are implementing Finish First and Seat tool and the processes. Now, in today's webinar, we I'm so delighted to have um, the opportunity to once again highlight another Finish First and See partner college. Today, we have Durham Technical Community College with us. So they'll share how they've been using the Finish First and See program. Now, we will have a space for questions at the end, but at, at any point at all, you have questions either for myself or for Abe. Um, do feel free to type them into the comment box and we'll get to them as soon as we're able to. And of course, if you have general questions at any time, you can always email me um, about the Finish First and See program and we'll be sure to get to you as soon as we're able to. And before we get started, I do wanna share just a few announcements with you. Um, so we are continuing on our journey, on our, ro our road of getting to the 58 sister colleges in the system. Um, currently we are at 44 colleges in the system that we've shared the Finish First NC tool with. And colleges that have recently come on include Montgomery Community College and Robeson Community College. I saw some of you guys from both those colleges here today. So thanks for joining us, those of you at the new colleges. Um, and we have a few more colleges scheduled um, before the end of the semester, including Alamance Community College and Craven Community College. Thank you to everyone who sent in your colleges data for the Finish First in Impact Study. If you have not sent in your data, there is still time and we would still love to get it from you. So please do send it in. And if you have questions about any part of it, do feel free to email me. And just want to remind everyone also that we are working with the Belk Center at uh, North Carolina Community, uh, I'm sorry, North Carolina State University. So I used to say Community College. <laughs> um, they're helping us with the evaluation um, to help us independently gauge the impact of um, the tool and also um, gauge best practices for using and implementing Finish First NC. And we actually have some of our research partners on um, the call with us today. So thank you, Rachel and Holly, for being with us also. I mentioned in the last webinar that next year we plan to roll out Finish First NC version 3.0. And this new version will have an updated inter interface. Um, it will also use less computer memory and will integrate student information into the output list that will make it easier to coordinate contacting students. Um, the new version will also include information that will help with the data gathering that you just did. Um, so that'll ease some of the load on the colleges um, when gathering the data. And just want to interject also, um, in the next round of data collection, we will not ask for everything that we did during this round. The baseline won't change. We won't ask for that again. And our plan is to only ask for one semester at a time. Um, but nonetheless, the new version will help um, with some of that data gathering. And we are continuing um, to update colleges, catalogs, and um, co with, and uh, so, sorry, also the colleges that have upcoming expiration dates. Um, if you have since us your updated catalog, know that it is in queue. Um, in general, though, you can expect to receive an update or a refresh of your Finish First and See program at or close to the date of your initial site visit or uh, around a year from your most recent update. Um, since we've expanded to almost 50 colleges, now we want to make sure that all colleges are able to access their Finish First and See programs, especially if it will be expiring soon. So we'll have to maintain that schedule um, of updates in order for us to do. Just want to also remind everybody that we do have a video of how to run the Finish First NC program that you can watch on demand. If you don't have that link, I've sent that out a couple of times, but if you don't have it or can't find it, shoot me an email. I'm happy to um, send it right back out to you. Um, after this webinar is over, I will share a brief survey to gather your feedback on the webinar. So please complete it when you receive it. And lastly, as I mentioned before, we are recording this webinar. So barring no technical difficulties, I'll share the link of the recording with you as well. And before we dive into the topic, are there any questions about uh, these announcements? Okay, well, as I mentioned, um, if you have questions at any point for myself or for um, Durham Tech, 
shoot, put, put them in the chat box and we'll be sure to get to them as soon as possible. All right, so into our topic, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. So you can get it, all right. Um, so we are excited to present our college spotlight. Um, as I mentioned, we're gonna be highlighting Durham Tech today. Um, they're in Durham, North Carolina, and they'll share information about um, their work with the Finish First NC project. And we'll, we'll be joined by Abe, um, Abraham Abe Donez, who is the Assistant Dean and Registrar at Durham Tech. Um, so Abe, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you. Yes, good morning all, and, and thank you for the opportunity to share our experience uh, with Finish First thus far, Layla. Um, I'm gonna ask you, number one, to, um, if any questions come in the chat, please um, feel free to interject because I lose chat when I start presenting via Teams. And um, the second important thing that I want to note before I get started is when we um, decided to implement Finish First and utilize the tool, um, we decided that we were going to focus on the graduation part of completers instead. Of, and, and this presentation will not focus on the near completers as much, and I'll explain a little later why um, we, we've decided to come to that conclusion. If you haven't seen, my pronouns are he, him, his, we, el y nosotros. And again, I am an assistant dean and the registrar at Durham Technical Community College. So this was the initial result that we experienced at Durham Tech when we first ran the tool. And we started the project of implementation with uh, Dr. Kai Wong and uh, Brian Bryan um, back in fall 2018 um, and then moved into spring 2019. We started in late fall 2018 and then implemented for spring 2019. And in that term, we identified both near completers and of course completers. And as you can see, um, we had some nice um, results. Um, I just wanna make a distinction that the 2019 spring completers in the dark green table in comparison to the 2019 spring completers in the light green table represent students that were um, identified as new new graduates. They did not have any previous um, credentials um, within Kali or in our system or, or their records were not noted as graduates from any type of program. And that's going to be a little important later on, as, you, as you'll see. So um, when we decided to move forward with the implementation and the delivery of the tool, um, I took initiative to bring some key partners and stakeholders into the conversation because first, there were some concerns around implementation and the tool. And so therefore, I invited um, our chief academic officer, our vice president of student services, the deans were brought into the conversation. And in that early conversation, these were some of the uh, ideas, thoughts, questions that came up. And so um, one, of the, one of the prevailing uh, questions, not questions, but thoughts was, the tool identifies students who were already in the queue to be graduated out in that specific term. And I don't know if your colleges are like mine, but we require students to apply for graduation. Yes, I know it's a problem and hopefully we are moving towards um, thinking of it differently instead of making this a requirement for students because we see it as a, as a barrier, in my opinion. I see it as a barrier. And so the first decision was um, deciding whether we were gonna include these students in the administrative graduation. And then we soon realized that it was probably not um, a good idea to do so because those students were already connecting with our office. Those students were already uh, following the proper procedures to be graduated out. The second idea was related to exceptions, substitutions, and waivers. So of course, different programs have different requirements outside of um, the credits within that program. So for instance, at that time, some of our health and wellness programs had a computer competency requirement. Um, that was not noted through completion of coursework. And so sometimes those students had to take a placement, not a placement test, a, a challenge exam to determine computer competency. Um, and that wasn't noted on a transcript in any way or form. Well, excuse me, it was noted on the transcript, but it was, it, it could, it was not included in the course requirements for the degree. Um, and then other courses in public safety had like a, and, and, and health and wellness had a CPR requirement. Of course, that's not noted on the credential. 
within colleague. Some other uh, different dynamics were related to our public service um, program. So fire protection programs, we provided um, non-course equivalencies or awarded non-course equivalencies to students who had completed certain coursework in the non-credit arena. Um, and our basic law enforcement training students those students who complete BLET also are awarded credit for their credential. And so we award them 15 credit hours towards the uh, Criminal Justice Associates degree program. And we realized that a lot of students who had completed that credential up until that point did not have that notation on their records, nor would um, finish first identify those courses at that time. Now, remember, this is the first iteration of finish first that I'm talking about at this present time. Another area of concern was that we were only using the 2018 catalog year. And unfortunately, the way um, the developers created the system, it would be impossible to go back and implement all of your previous catalog years to be as robust as possible in considering student satisfied requirements from previous programs that had different iterations or different requirements in place. Another concern, for, especially from our faculty, were um, the comprehensive articulation agreement and the specific requirements, for instance, ACA requirement. And so what Finish First allowed us to do was identify students who had completed their credentials. And so ACA is known as a first term course at Durham Tech. It's actually required during the first term um, within specific programs, mostly our uh, diplomas and our associate degree. Um, programs. And therefore, by this time, if a student had met the requirements of the credential and did not have ACA, what were we going to do about it? Um, and that was the chief um, the chief academic officer's call, and, and, and she would have to figure out what approach we would take in order to either waive the requirement or what we were going to do in order to satisfy the requirement. Um, then we started getting questions, you know, from everybody. Well, what, what does the administrative process look like? Um, of course, it, within Colleague itself, what, what programs need to be active in order for a student to be able to graduate out. And so um, these were all specific questions to the system itself and Colleague and how it manages the graduation process. Other concerns arrived around the outstanding balance, library issues, um, veterans and, and graduating veterans out and, and what does that do and, and possibly how it impacts their um, eligibility for their benefits. Then when will the report um, run? How far are we going to go back? What does that process look like? And then um, one final, uh, sorry, one final question was um, the status of students and colleagues. So some could be active in a program or two, others can be closed. And so therefore, what did that look like and what was the lift in order to try to update student records to reflect um, accurate status in order for us to execute this process? So along with, with those early um, ideas and conversations, we, we also presented some challenges and also tried to adjust those challenges. And I try to capture that here. So um, the first thing that, that, that came to our attention, of course, was what if a student was identified as a completer? And what I mean by this is Finish First will identify a student um, who has completed any credential with the coursework they have accumulated at, um, at the college. And so uh, during our first iteration of Finish First, we decided that we were going to only award credentials to first time completers, meaning that they had not received any type of uh, credential from the college. Um, I, I will say that this, this was short sighted. And um, doing it all over again, we would not take this approach, and I'll explain to you all later why. Um, the second challenge was that we didn't have a policy in place for administrative graduation. And so there was a lot of conversation at the college about um, who should be eligible, what rights do students have regarding administrative graduation, what right did the college have. And so what we decided to do very early on, sorry was, and I'm going to just go to our policies and procedures so you can all see it. Um, we decided to implement a, a, a policy. Um, we decided to implement a statement in our policies and procedures about program completion and graduation. And that's the statement right there. Um, it, it was uh, 
lines. It was also the opportunity to kind of um, ensure that this was a process that was included at the college. That way, if we had questions about the operations, we had something to substantiate why we were doing it and the reasoning behind it. So that led us to what happened when we uh, identified students who were completers and they had outstanding balances. And so we decided at that time that the students would not be awarded the credential. Notice I put parentheses at, at revisiting um, because I think this is a topic of conversation that we will continue to have on how do we best support students because if they left us, if they left the college and they had an outstanding balance, well, was it due to finances? Uh, it had to have been due to finance, or, or were they even aware? We we learned very early on that some students may have left the institution and didn't realize they had an outstanding balance with the library, um, or, or they had an outstanding balance with the business office. And so what are ways that we're mitigating that information with students to ensure that they are aware and if they can pay the fee then they'd be awarded the credential so um, we're trying to think of more creative ways to ensure students are being informed and aware of what they're eligible for and then um, another idea was do we provide students the opportunity for them to opt out of administrative graduation and we thought it was important that a student would have a say so in the matter if they wanted to opt out um, of the process and therefore through our through our formal process we created a um, opportunity and a window for them to respond to the request or it, not the request but the solicitation that they were being graduated administratively and if they did not want to be part a participant in the process let us know Continuing with some of the challenges and the, and, and the responses or solutions that we face. So the other idea was the timeline for completing the process. And of course, this was a new way of doing things. So there was a lot of uncertainty behind our approach. I decided to take the lead on this effort because I wanted to make sure that my team felt supported with the implementation of this process. And if there were concerns that were arising as we were developing the process, then at least I could be informed and address those concerns um, immediately. Another area of concern was um, our inability to possibly get in touch with students because we have uh, inaccurate information and in colleague, right? And so we decided to take a tier approach in how we communicated with students. So first we tried email. If we were not um, productive in that effort, then we will move to telephone calls. And if yet again, we were not successful, then we actually mailed information out to students um, to the current address that we have listed in colleague. Um, I will tell you this, that we, I probably mailed out, physically mailed out one item because the other two efforts were, were more uh, successful. Um, the next challenge that we faced was how do we consider this impact on our student veterans and international students? Um, if you're not aware, there's certain requirements for veterans and international students to be to either maintain their visas or to be eligible for their GI um, bills. And so we decided that as an office, we would directly contact our, our colleagues in those specific areas who were supporting these specific populations and uh, be in contact and let them know what was taking place throughout the process. And then the final challenge was um, because I was getting resistance in regards to implementation, could we move um, this process to the summer because we don't have as many graduates in the summer like we do in the spring? And then the response to, to, to that question was, who are we really here, who are we really here to serve? And, and, and is, is this about ourselves or the students? And so recognizing that change is hard, but this work to me was very meaningful. And so we continue with the approach of graduating students out in the spring term who we identified as completers. Hey, we have a question on the floor. Sure. Um, so Joanne says you mentioned an opt out for students who didn't want to be administratively graduated. Did any mm -hmm. students opt out if they uh, and if so, what reasons did they give? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so jo Joanne, thanks for that question. And yes, there were students who did opt out. And if you give me a few more minutes, I'll cover that in a later slide. 
um, because it's very interesting um, what what I learned through this process, right? Um, so what did the process look like? So again, I explained to you all that we um, decided to collaborate with with um, Kai um, and he was instrumental in getting us up and running. So if you're reserved or feeling any caution that you're not going to have the right support to get this done, please throw that thought away. Um, the team um, at Finish First NC has been immaculate and, and are very responsive and are willing to really spend and invest the necessary time to see this come to fruition at your colleges. Um, then once we ran the reports, I had to take a step back and look what the report was giving me and taking a look at what our system was telling me. And so I decided to use Excel and organize the reports. And what we did was, again, we separated the new graduates versus those who had completed some type of credential at the institution. And again, remember I stated that this was a short-sighted attempt because at that time, the focus and the attention was on performance measures. It was not on the student, unfortunately. And I think we missed an opportunity, but I'll, I'll again talk about it in a little bit. What we also decided to do was instead of a letter or a set of correspondence coming from me, we felt like this was such an important accomplishment. We decided and asked our president to write a letter congratulating the students, sharing the information of their accomplish, accomplishment, and then what other things could happen after this, right? And so if you're if you're if you're going this route and, and you know that there that your institution may be challenged um, with getting such a letter, start this early. But I think it was a good way of um, highlighting the the installation of the tool, but also the impact of a student now receiving correspondence directly from the president, um, I thought had um, major impact as well. Then we decided to establish the timeline for students to respond to the request. And we actually determined 14 days was enough time that if a student was sent the email communication that they could respond to us um, um, making the determination that they wanted to opt out. Um, I used the mail merge feature in Excel and Outlook to send the communication to graduates. It was very quick and easy um, using those fields. And then um, once I had my list of students that we were going to administrative, administratively graduate, I ran a batch evaluation um, using colleague, of course, and then I, I manually audited the students to ensure the GPA and the 25% requirement were met. Well, luckily version two with, um, with collaboration um, through, through uh, Finish First NC and colleges that had implement, implemented version one, realized that this was a piece of the work that was needed. And so therefore version two takes care of this measure. And I'll show you some examples later on. But in order for me to assure that students had completed the requirement, I had to make sure that they satisfied these requirements because it's required by our institution. Um, the next step was now asking um, my team and the colleagues within uh, admissions registration and records to add these program codes to student records because of course you can't move forward with the process and um, colleague to um, to graduate students without them having an active program code and then we graduated them there was a second communication that we provided to those who were graduated because we wanted to make sure that we offered them the opportunity to participate in our graduation ceremony. And so that communication had a lot of information about the details about participation, about when it was taking place, about the process of printing the diplomas and the timelines of when they will be mailed and expected arrival for the student. So this was the, <laughs> this was the first example of um, what I had to go back and do um, when I when I determined who were the completers, right? And I'm sorry, because this should say um, not near completer. This should say completers. And so the two areas that are circled was number one. I will also state that finish first help highlight some problems that we had in college, because as you can see here, um, where it's kind of yellowish and green around it. The program status says in progress for this for this specific program, but as you can see, they satisfied all of the requirements and they have the valid GPA. 
And I, I was able to tell that this was 100% completer at the college. And so what Finish First also helped and assisted us with is identifying why was this listing in progress, therefore letting us go back and review our settings in Colleague to see what's going on, why is this being calculated the way it is, and why is it not acknowledging a student as a completer, right? This was the result of the second version of Finish First. And so I just gave one example of instance of a, of a student who was a near completer. And so the beauty about this um, result was once we ran the tool, it identifies the student, of course, the program. It tells me how much of that program has been completed. 90%, right? Tells me what has been met. And then the beauty of this is it tells me what courses are still av available for applying to the degree. So this is where the course substitutions um, come into play. This is where exceptions come into play. And all that is just either institutional history or it lives in some type of memos or a combination of all those things. So this is where um, those for experience with graduating students outcomes extremely important. So what I decided to do with this list is any student that was at 80% or higher I had a graduation evaluator look at the results um, of, of this list to determine if any of those courses not used can satisfy the requirements yet not fulfilled within that program of study. The other benefit of, of these results were it was giving the given, excuse me, it was producing the GPA for the students and it was telling me how many percent of the coursework was completed at the college. So this helped tremendously in regards to um, knowing where the student was in regards to um, program requirements. And so this was extremely helpful. And this, again, was a, a, a effort by uh, the Finish First team to, uh, to amplify and um, add on what they've already started with the first version. Abe, hey, we have a couple more questions on the floor. Sure, go ahead. Um, the first two have to do with sharing some of your resources, if you would be able to share the presentation slides and then also the possibility of sharing the letter from your president, maybe just the text if you don't want to share the whole letter. Um, yeah, not a problem at all. Not a problem at all. And I, at the end of this, um, of, of this PowerPoint slide, I have my email address, so feel free to send me um, that request and I'll be happy to share that information or Layla I can also share it with you all to have in a repository to share with other schools in regards to kind of what we did. That would be perfect and yep. then the uh, third question is what did you find in colleague that caused it to not show pending or complete? Sure so some of the um some of some of the the repeat um policies in colleague and how they were programmed were impacting how some of the, the in-progress statuses were showing for students. Um, this then, um, this was the, th this is the output file for those who are completers, right? And so again, it gives you a list of the student IDs, the program codes, the titles. And again, this was extremely helpful in version two because it also gave me the GPA calculation and it gave me the percentage of institutional credits completed by students. And as you can see, um, it's, it, it's really useful when you're trying to go through this list to see who satisfies the requirements of the college because anybody under 25% would not be eligible. Um, and then what are the options do we provide those students? But uh, again, the, the version two was it was like going from a Honda to a Mercedes. So I can't I can't imagine what version three is going to look like. So I'm really excited that there's a third version coming out. Um, so looking forward to see what um, other amenities have been added to support this work. And I will tell you that, um, and Layla can attest to this and, and, and Kai can attest to this, they reached that back, back out to me once we finished the tool and they would say, hey, what's needed here? And um, it's through those collaborations and those intentional conversations that I believe some information was shared where they were taking notes to say, yep, yep, this sounds like we need to work on it. And they came back with this. So when we saw the second iteration of the first version, we were extremely excited to see that a lot of the conversation that we had and the needs that we were still experiencing with the tool were also being met through what they were delivering. 
So when we talk about um, when we talk about what we learned, right, and what we take away, and this goes back to I believe Joanne's question when she said, "Well, who opted out and who decided to opt out?" Interestingly enough, um, we were I, I was surprised to learn that many of our students did not have a thorough understanding of what a stackable credential was. And so we walked around the college marketing our, our stack credentials and telling people how beneficial it is, yet the, yet the ones who need to know the information the best were not aware of what a stackable credential was. So most of the students that requested to be opted out were actually students who were still in seeking associate degrees, but they had satisfied the requirements of some of those stackable credentials in, in, in versions of certificates or diplomas. Most of these were our, our IT students, right? And so had to go back and have individual conversations with those students because not only did they want to opt out, they started asking questions, well, is this going to impact my ability to earn my associate's degree? And so I really had to think about that, right? Like what is not happening when the students are going through these processes, when our students are, are going through our coursework to help inform and better prepare students to be aware of what they're eligible for? Because to me, the stackable credential only amplifies that student's um, ability to move into a, a career that will help with economic mobility and provide um, an opportunity for them to advance. And so um, that was one area of concern that was highlighted through this process. And so how do we better strategize as an institution to ensure that we're supporting students with what they need and being fully aware of what they're eligible for and how it impacts or does not impact their further um, their further education in regards to attaining a higher credential. The other part was, um, how do we strategically involve faculty in this process? Because this is all on the student services side, but there are some courses that are sequential in nature that at the culmination of that course, students typically are eligible for some type of certificate or degree. So how do we involve faculty in the conversation to say, hey, when students are about to complete this class, maybe including some information in your coursework or including something in your syllabi that let them know if you've completed all these courses, then you're eligible for this certificate. Go ahead and apply for graduation or submit a request to be graduated out. And therefore, we have we avoid having to identify the student in this process, right? The second um, area of takeaway for me was that um, credential all students identified. And so remember when I said earlier that our approach was a little short sighted. Um, and it's because we did not recognize the value of awarding students a credential that either they intended or did not intend to complete, right? Because um, again, it lends itself to making our students more competitive for employability and for upward mobility. So how do we make sure that students are being awarded these credentials in a way that benefits them? It's a value added benefit. And in my opinion, it, it continues to support the momentum for them to finish other degrees if that's the long-term goal. And then the final area for us that was a takeaway was the resources that we required um, in order to accomplish this work. And so um, depending on the structure of your institution, you might have to be very strategic in nature on how you, on who and how you, you unravel this product, right? And so we realized that um, we needed additional human resources for the outreach and recruitment of near completers. We didn't have that in place. We don't officially have an admissions office at the college. We we had a semi recruiter, but um, it was not an effective strategy. And and the results of the near completer file was kind of um, alarming because it was so large, right? And 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 we wanted to. Um, strategize on how to reach out to potential students and getting them so they complete the degree, but we really didn't have the structure and the human resources in order to um, effectuate that effort. So as you're thinking about this, these are some of the considerations that I hope you begin to take 
um, with you. So therefore, when you're ready for implementation or when you're ready for execution, those are the things that you have in mind. Um, the other part that I will make mention here that I didn't note on this slide, but it's also for um, those who do the graduation, the auditing and the graduation at your college, be involved in this process. And the reason why I say that is because many of those individuals are well informed and have depending on how long they've been with the institution, have historical knowledge on things that may have existed um, for a very long time. And I'll give you a perfect example. I've only been in my role as registrar at Durham Tech for three years. I've only been a part of this office for the same amount of time. I transitioned from another area of the college. So a lot of agreements, a lot of memos, a lot of um, articulations that existed within the college, I was not aware of. And so that lack of information um, really caused um, some my inability to really um, effectuate the graduation of students because I had to now depend on other individuals for that work. And so bringing those team members into the conversation a lot earlier because they can lend their level of expertise in ways that you, you may not if you don't have that background or context, right? I will say that um, there were times where we were a little uncertain about things. I had, I, in the very beginning, um, Kai reached out to me and asked for our programs of study. And they're amazing, right? They gave me the informal report that I needed to create. They gave me all of the fields that I needed to pick uh, pick in my informal report to produce the information. And unfortunately, I tried everything and I had to reach out to my information technology department and we could not get this one field that Kai needed in order for him to develop the um, program to study for us. So we then had to go to a different route and Kai asked me for all uh, PDF versions of all our programs of study and utilize the information that way. But um, I just wanna make sure that it's clear to everyone that there's, there's some great support behind these efforts from um, the Finish First NC team and Layla leads that initiative now, but um, there, there are some amazing colleagues who definitely wanna see this a success at your institution. So at those points of hesitation and, and at those points of uncertainty, don't hesitate with reaching out to them and ask specific questions. I also remember at one point my, my, my passport had expired and you talk about freaking out, so, but again, just reaching back out to them, no, we got this, Abe, it's gonna be fine. Um, and they're really supportive and I really have appreciated the collaboration between us. And then finally, the other, um, the other aspect of this work were how will students pay for credentials? And so it just so happens that Durham Tech was in the middle of a transition when we um, delivered um, Finish First, well, when, when Finish First was delivered to us and we executed. We actually were moving away from charging students graduation fees um, for participation or for diploma printing. We, the college decided to, um, um, to require those tuition and fees throughout the student's enrollment at the institution. So we, we included those fees in our tuition and fees while students are matriculated. That way at the end, um, we avoid this issue of, well, can they pay for a credential and all of those other intricacies that kind of become barriers. And so um, it just so happened that, that that year we were, sorry, this was spring. So that following fall, we were moving forward with the implementation of tuition and fees in the in, um, throughout the register, throughout the period of time that the student was registered. So the college actually incurred the cost of printing all of the um, credentials for that term for students who had graduated with their diploma covers and allowed them to participate in graduation. Um, so it was a win-win for all those um, in that given semester. And now moving forward, we never have to deal with that issue, whether a student can pay um, for the printing of the credential or not. It's just incurred in our tuition and fees and it's covered by the college. And Leila, uh, that's all I have. I hope I, I have met your standard on what you wanted, and I'm here to entertain uh, more questions if, if, if necessary. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Abe. If anyone wants to type your question in the chat box, or if you want to unmute your microphone and um, type your or uh, say your question, go ahead and do that. Or if not a question, if you want to maybe share um, your impressions or takeaways, you can also share that either in the chat box or um, if you want to unmute your microphone. 
All right, so Chris from um, Brunswick says, how are you reporting grads to the clearinghouse? That's a good we question. We, no, no different than a, than a student that has been with us and is graduating at the same term. We report them as graduates. And Sonia and, says, are, am I sending the presentation to us all or do we need to send an individual message? So Abe, if you want to share the slides with me, I can make that a PDF and then send that out to everybody. Absolutely. Layla, this is Joanne again, um, and thank you, Abe, for that very, very good presentation. And I know you responded to my question of regarding the student opt out um, and that it really was almost a student not understanding the right. value of it. And it was an education piece. And I guess this is for you, but also for maybe some of the others on the call. I'm just wondering if there really is a valid reason for a student to opt out of this. Um, you know, I, I'm looking at the perspective as that I almost feel that the college could be liable if we're if somebody has completed a credential and we don't give it to them. And I'm also concerned about not awarding a credential because of the impact it could have on for financial aid and not realizing that students are continuing to take courses in a program they've already completed. But I'm just curious, and uh, is there really a good reason other than just not understanding, you know, that a student should be able to opt out of receiving a credential when they've completed all requirements? So, so my, 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 my initial reaction is um, it, it's very specific to the needs of that student, right? So um, I, I think when I'm thinking of the financial aid question, it's not so much of eligibility for financial aid, but more I'm thinking of veterans at that point um, and, and how that impacts them if they're graduated out of a program. I think when we determined the opt out option for students, it was we were challenged with the ethical question when we were having this when we were having when we were engaged in this topic basically why am i awarding a student or potentially awarding a student a credential that they didn't intend to receive um, I, I think that's the basis of the question the opt out became a um, option because we wanted to make sure that we afforded the student that option and not automatically say no you're being graduated out without no say um, that was the reason why um, the notification be became extremely important to the student and then offering them that window of opportunity to say, no, this is not what I want. Um, to be honest, um, I, not many people, uh, we probably had about, I would say at the end, if my memory serves right, I think it was about nine, excuse me, nine students who decided to opt out. And those nine students were currently enrolled and continuing to um, further their education because they were trying to reach, uh, they were trying to obtain a higher credential. And so I didn't receive any concerns um, or any students that were not willing to be credentialed um, because it was a program or degree that they didn't want. Um, the other part was being very strategic with working with veteran services and working with our Center for the Global Learner who manage our international students because there were some concerns about students being graduated from a program and then losing eligibility for visa. Um, so that was um, an intentional conversation and an intentional partnership with those areas and those individuals to ensure that those students were not impacted in a negative way. And uh, Gwendolyn mentioned this. This is um, related to what you're just talking about. Now, veterans was a concern because they do use their funds in a different way. We do have information in our catalog about the administrat administrative graduation. Thanks for that, Gwendolyn. Um, and there were a couple of, oh, I'll mention this other comment of yours also, Gwendolyn, Feist, excuse me, Forsyth um, awards credentials without giving the students the option to opt out for the reasons Joanne mentioned. And a couple of other questions we have too. Um, Chris from Brunswick asks, what date or term are you using? Past term, current term, or future term? So we, we went with the current term. And the reason why we went with the current term was if I'm using a uh, 2018 catalog year <laughs> and I had a student who hadn't been with us since um, 2010, I just didn't feel comfortable awarding a credential <laughs> but dating it back to 2020, 2010 when the current version of the catalog was 2018. Another question, Emily Davis from Pitt says, how do you identify AHS or GED, I found my reports are not identifying those students, so manual checks are required unless I'm missing something. 
Um, and Kai, I don't know if you want to jump in here, but Abraham, if you want to share your thoughts on that, you can too. I, I well, I don't have a thought because I haven't experienced that, but I'll be. Um, I'm listening because you learn a lot from Kai for sure. <laughs> well, let, let, let me take that question, Emily. Um, the current program study only included the curriculum program of study. So if you want to include the GED and an AHS, uh, technically it's not a problem. Uh, all we need is the program requirements that include those two program studies. However, uh, when you pull the transcript, you also need to include those courses that are offered in the adult high schools or the GEDs. So um, that will drastically expand your transcript size. Uh, and also uh, most of the curriculum students probably don't have that part of, of this. I mean, one way to resolve it is to separate the process. You only pull those students in the adult high school or GEDs, then you evaluate those students against those program requirements. Uh, there's a way to, to work on that. If you want to uh, pilot on that, yeah. we can work with you on that. Thanks, Kaim. Um, a couple more questions. Heather from Nash, Heather Perry from Nash. I wonder if the student has a loan and would enter in repayment. So that's if you um, confer the stackable credential. Is that what you're asking about, Heather? I was just commenting where it, where it would be a student concern because if the student had a loan and then they have a graduated status, they'd enter in repayment. So I was just thinking that maybe why they wouldn't want the credential. Uh, okay. Did you run into that at all, Abe? I did not. Okay. Yeah. A few more questions and thoughts. So Scott Byington, uh, some AAS faculty were actually a little concerned that they were notifying students that they were finishing a credential, meaning the student may not want to continue for the uh, associate's degree. They would take their diploma and go. So the concern was that if they got their, um, their mm -hmm. lesser credential than the associate's, that they would leave and never come back. I know we kind of touched on that in our check in on Friday, Abe. I don't know if you want to share anything about that. Sure. No. I, so I, I, I think um, I think we need to stop thinking um, with a deficit mindset, in my opinion. Um, if a student is attempting to earn a credential and they're leaving the institution because they're trying to work and establish themselves and gain economic mobility, then am I really serving that student in that instance? and uh, saying, no, you should stay back. Um, I, I think we need to approach this in, in individually and, and understand the needs of the students. So hopefully what is taking place is that a robust conversations with students are happening. Um, I don't know about other institutions, but I know with um, some of our certificate programs, because we don't have the data to substantiate um, their effectiveness, there are times where those certificates are not financial aid eligible. And I, I'm, this is a being transparent because that's the only no, that's the only way I know how to be. Right. And so what, what some institutions have done and what we have done is we promoted a different degree for that student to complete. And if it's a stackable credential, then that student becomes eligible for aid under that higher degree. Well, unfortunately, um, you know, ethics come into question with that with that practice, number one. And number two is the reality is if a student is trying to complete a credential, they, they, either they're going to complete the credential and go, or their, their, their goal is the advanced degree and they will remain. It's going to be only through conversations of advising and coaching with students that you're, we're going to be know whether that student truly intends to um, stay at the institution to further their, their degree or, or leave because there's a specific need. Yeah, and I, I think as Abe mentioned, that's a philosophical question that your stakeholders will want to consider, will want to continue to discuss. There's also the danger if a student stops out and then never comes back at all. Um, so there are a couple of things to weigh there, but all good conversations for your stakeholders to discuss at your college and knowing your student body and um, kind of what what makes the most sense, what are some of the risk factors, what are some of the benefits of, of doing that all. So a comment from Gwendolyn, once we 
completed our first huge run of finish first, which included the backlog. We're now using the current semester, which also allows us to communicate with the student at which time uh, if they have questions, they can reach out. We have not had any students say they did not want their degree intended or not. Um, many uh, that was not intended uh, was because they did not know that they were eligible. Most were excited, so that's that's good to hear. And big shout out to Mama Gwen because she's she's one of those um, individuals that I reach out to consistently for guidance and <laughs> and her expertise. And so she's very much appreciated and love that she's engaged in this conversation. Absolutely, she says no, oh, ma'am. <laughs> no, ma'am. You give credit where credit is due. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, were there other questions or any key takeaways that you wanted to share? Well, no, I, 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 I encourage any institution that's 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 journeying through this process now to just sit back and enjoy the ride. It's, it's not as it's not as bad as it as it possibly seems and, and to really rely on the resources that you all provide because you have been instrumental in in supporting Durham Tech with where we are and we're just looking forward to the continued partnership. I mean, you all have not let me down in any way and have been consistently there to show that level of support, to show that level of caring, and to really make sure that we're doing the best for our students at Durham Tech and our students in North Carolina. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for that. Well, um, just a few closing announcements. As a reminder, I will send uh, a brief survey to get your feedback on today's webinar. So um, we're interested in your feedback. I do read the surveys. Um, after you send them in. So please do that. And again, I will send, send out the recording. I'll get those resources from Abe and send those out to everyone as well. Um, Kai, anything to share with everyone else? Uh, no, other than uh, working on the next version, hopefully that will very much. Oh. Well, uh, hopefully the version 3.0 will drastically simplify your data reporting. So far, you know, the data reporting might be a drag, but um, but what what my intention was that when you run the report or when you run the software, the data reporting will be completed by the software. So all you need to do is copy and paste the data into the data collection template. So very excited about that. Yes, lots of great things up the pipeline. Uh, well, we will stick around um, for a few more moments in case there are other folks who want to ask questions outside of the recording or outside of the webinar. Um, Abe will stick around um, for a little bit too in case you have questions for him. Um, and if not, I hope you all have a great Thanksgiving, a very safe Thanksgiving. Please do um, remain safe during these holiday seasons. Uh, and again, if you need any um, help or have any questions, do feel free to reach out to us offline and we are here to help. So thanks so much, everybody. Hope you have a great week.